My name is Deepa and I am one of the leadership team members with MAFSO and I work as a hospital social worker with Hamilton Health Sciences. Thank you everyone for joining. Let me begin the session with a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. Malayali Association of Social Workers in Ontario is a community-based registered organization of professional social work practitioners of Malayali descent in Ontario. With around 600 members at the moment, MASO is an entirely volunteer organization. With the help of our members, we support our communities in addressing problems including domestic violence, mental health challenges, and child abuse. We also provide a broad spectrum of services related to social workers' professional development, employment, and social integration. February marks the Black History Month in the US and Canada in tribute to the contributions made by Black people to the country. This month's open up avenues of conversations on the realities of racial injustice, oppression, and exclusion faced by the Black communities and their resistant, resilience and persistence for change, bringing together the voice of Black communities and their allies. The key reason why MASO is conducting the webinar on how to understand and address anti-Black racism is because we as social workers from racially marginalized communities exposed to a major sector of societal shift. As social workers of visible minorities, it is critical for us to engage in ongoing reflection, learning, and most importantly, unlearning to facilitate meaningful systematic change and becoming an ally with anti-Black racism initiative in our communities. Education and awareness is a key to social change and being social workers of color. It is essential that we know how to advocate against racism on for ourselves and for others. Canadian social narratives have systematically suppressed the representation of black, indigenous and other racialized minorities. The public discourse of black experience is often centered around transatlantic slave trade intergenerational trauma and violence systematically sliding their great contribution and resilience. Knowing the root of anti-Black racism, multiple forms of its manifestation and recognizing how deeply it entrenched in our social fabric is essential to address the Black anti-Black racism. And it is collective responsibility as a whole. We need to also acknowledge that racism still exists and together, we need to oppose racism in all its forms. Learning from experts on how they navigated their jobs and channel their voice against systematic oppression will be thought-provoking and instructive. Maso is extremely grateful and thankful that we have such eminent person with us as a chief guest for our webinar, Mr. Chima Stephen Stim. Chima holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Toronto, an executive certificate in public leadership from Howard Kennedy School with a certificate in promoting racial equity in the workplace and leadership and inclusion certificate from Centennial College. He's also a Canadian certified inclusion professional through the Canadian Center of Diversity and Inclusion. Chima holds several leadership positions in child welfare, including the Director of Service and the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging. I should also emphasize that PLCAS is widely known for the collaborative models of anti-oppressive practices deeply rooted in the philosophy of DEI in child welfare with the lowest number of children in care in Ontario. This achievement greatly owes to the consistent effort by transformational leaders like Chima over decades. He's a consultant, leadership coach, and a dynamic workshop facilitator. He has led organizational change trainings, developed several employee resource groups, and created various cultural uh, services with focus on ensuring excellent client and staff experiences. And it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Chima to the webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Nice to see all of you here today on Saturday. Um, uh, this is uh, great. Um, I want to really thank all of you um, uh, for inviting us here today. Uh, this speaks to your strength and abilities to tackle anti-Black racism and all type of injustices. 
So I want to really, really thank all of you for being present here today and for giving us the opportunity to join this meeting with you. So when I was told to come here, you know, to um, help with uh, the conversation today, um, uh, Charles, uh, you know, we had a, you know, um, a conversation and I said, you know, my day is so full, you know, um, uh, even if I'm, I'll be off. And he said, Chima, we really, really need you. I want you to be here, you know? So he was really persistent, you know, for me to be here today, you know? So, and uh, I said, of course, in anything that you want, I will make sure that I, you know, that I, 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 do, I do that. So today I would like to, you know, I don't have a, you know, um, uh, a developed speech for this uh, um, uh, meeting, important meeting today. But I like to really focus on the role of leadership, you know, in tackling anti-Black racism and all sorts of inequalities. Um, uh, leadership is very important. You all hold leadership responsibilities and leadership roles across various organizations and also across your communities, you are highly, highly seen as a leader. So among others, what can leaders do to tackle inequality and specifically anti-Black racism within the various platforms in which you find yourself? So, I will use, you know, um, uh, great authors like Robert Livingston of Harvard and Ibrahim X. Candy as a guide to my short conversation with you guys or my short presentation with all of you. So coming here as immigrants, we are always told to work hard, right? Always told to work hard. When you work hard, everything will be okay. But that's not quite true, right? As immigrants, we work five times harder here always. And as people of color, we work five times harder as always to get to where we are supposed to be. And a lot of the times we are not even we don't have the chance or the abilities to be there. There are policies and practices in the society, companies, organizations, that prevent us from getting far, no matter how hard we work. So the question is not whether we have to work hard or harder. Leaders should take a deeper look I'd like to provide a framework for you to take a look at that. And I know that Heather is here, you know, she can expand, you know, in the conversation today. But leaders should take a deeper look at the system at which they operate from. We all operate from a system. Take a deeper look at the system in which you operate from. And ask yourself, some of these questions that Ibrahim X. Candy has asked. What are the problems inherent in that system that you operate from? Who are the players in the system? Do you see yourself there as one of the players? Who are the decision makers in that system? So that's a challenge for you. I want you everywhere you are, even in your children's schools, in different areas, different tables that you are that you find yourself. Look around that table. Who are the players in that system? How do this, ask yourself the next question also, how do these players influence the narrative in the system? 
how do they shape the narrative? And where do these narratives come from? This is very, very important. As you look at inequality in the system that we are all part of a lot of the time. Very, very important for all of us. Self-examination, a critical look, a reflective approach to practice is important as you try to deal with anti-Black racism. Racism in itself is adaptively challenging in nature. What do I mean by that? I mean that it takes a lot of people to actually make sure that equality is achieved in everywhere that you are in. It's difficult for one person to do that work. So if you all, you know, if you don't make sure that you put your strength together, it will be very difficult to have this kind of problem shouldered by one individual. You need allyship in the process. Allyship is very important in order to make sure that you move to the next step of the ladder in terms of fighting anti-black anti -black racism. Robert Livingston of Harvard provides a clear framework to look at issues of racism, inequality in every platform that we are in. He uses the word press, the press framework in exam examining inequality in the society. And uh, you know, there's a book that he wrote called The Conversations. And that's what, a book that I like all of you to actually, you know, try to get and review that book. It's centered, I know, I know in, uh, in what's happening in the United States, but it's applicable all over. That's the press framework. P as in press stands for problem awareness. So that's what I've spoken about here. Before you can be able to embark on the journey of tackling inequality, you have to be aware of the problem itself. How aware are you of the problem that you're trying to deal with? If you're not aware of the problem, you cannot be able to move to the next level, which is the root cause analysis. That is R for root cause. You have to be able to understand the root causes of that issue. What are the root causes of racism in the society? Why are people racist towards others? If you are able to understand the root cause, then you can go to the next level, which is empathy. When you understand the problem in everything that you're doing, you'll be able to exercise empathy towards that situation. You'll be empathetic about that issue. But if you don't understand the problem and if you don't know the root cause, you will not be able to be empathetic. Then the next one is S as in strategy. Because when you are aware of the problem, you understand the root cause, you are empathetic, you'll be able to get people together to actually to develop a strategy that you can be able to deal with the problem. 
it's very important that we, we go through these steps. And the next one that leaders should do is sacrifice, which is the last S there. You have to be able to sacrifice something in order to make sure that you deal with a problem such as racism. Sacrifice is very important. You may have to share your power. As leaders, again, I talk about racism, but also inequality across societies, across communities, in your villages. What kind of power are you sharing in order to make sure that others can actually experience what, you know, some of the gains that you have made? This is how you have to always take a look. The press framework gives you that lens in which you can be able to tackle these issues. It's important when you are when you've done all this, I think you come to the place where you can call yourself an anti-racism um, uh, leader. And anti-racism is somebody with an idea that all racial groups are equal and that none of these racial groups need development or policies in order to make sure they are equal to everyone. They do not need you know, to be developed. No racial group needs to be developed in order for them to be equal to the next racial group. You have to believe that all racial groups are equal. And you also have to make sure that you, that you, that you are not assimilationist in your perspective. You can, you, you know, your goal is not to you know, allow the other race, racial group to be assimilated into your own racial group. Because assimilationists believe that, that their own racial group are superior to others. And you also have to make sure that you pay attention to people who are segregationist in nature. Segregationist has a racist idea that a perpetually inferior race group will never be developed. So they support policies that further isolate other races. I have to also say that race is a social construct. And it's important that we are aware of that. However, it's important that we pay attention to how we act, how we behave, what policies we champion in the platforms that we find ourselves consistently every day and every time. How we speak to others is important in this process. So once again, you know, I'm not going to take all of your time here today, but I want, I, I want to thank you so much for having me here and for you know, listening to me as well. And my hope is that uh, you know, there are a few things here today that some of you, you know, or all of us can take along with us as we champion inclusion, equity, belonging, racial equality in the society or in the communities that we serve consistently. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shima. Now I request Elsa. She's a member of our MASA community and she's a registered social worker and a social service worker. And she's currently working as an early childhood educator to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you, Deepa. 
Dear Mr. Chima, thank you sincerely for your enlightened talk today. Your presence has been invaluable and we appreciate your significant contribution to the event. Your tireless dedication to this, uh, to this course serves as a genuine inspiration, particularly for us social workers from this minority community. And I resonate deeply with your emphasis on the significance of allyship. As the only person of color and immigrant at my workplace, your words about standing against uh, racism and the importance of allyship truly hit home. Your insights have further fueled our commitment to this crucial cause. Once again, uh, uh, from the name of Maso and myself, I extend my sincere gratitude for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Chima. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Elsa. I request Joel Vargas to do the land acknowledgement. He is a grade 12 student and he's a son of one of our leadership members, Mr. Vargas Jacob. Jacob. Thank you. Oh. We are on land that has been traditionally caretaken and stewarded by indigenous peoples. The area now known as Toronto has been the territory and home of many indigenous nations for thousands of years prior to the arrival of European colonizers. Toronto is now governed by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. This is an arrangement between host nations, including the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Wendake peoples. Toronto is also governed by the Toronto Purchase Treaty, 13, 1805. Thanks, John. The social work profession has always had many courageous and bold women leaders doing the good work around the world. Maso is extremely thankful that we have one such strong woman social worker with us today who believe in social work towards social justice, human rights, and treating others with dignity and respect. It's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Heather Efra to the webinar. Heather is a Ghanaian Canadian woman born and raised in Toronto. She has been practicing as a social worker for nearly 10 years and currently works in the child welfare sector, leading the anti-Black racism work. Heather engages, trains, and collaborates with various community stakeholders in the pursuit of equitable outcomes and improved experience for the Black children, youth, and families in Toronto. Heather holds a Bachelor of Social Work degree from the Toronto Metropolitan University and a Master's degree in Social Work from the York University. Welcome, Heather. Thank you so much for that introduction, Deepa, and good morning, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here today to speak after Chima. My goodness, let me see if I can do this. Thank you so much for that, Chima. I've just learned that Robert Livingston framework um, from you. So I'll be certainly looking further into that. Very relatable and very connected to the framework that I'll be presenting today as well, which many of you may have heard of. Um, I believe Ashik was going to put up some slides. So maybe I'll just Wait a moment for my slides to get on before I get started. Thank you so very much. That's great. So I'll be spending our time today speaking um, a bit in depth about anti-Black racism and highlighting six key ways that it manifests. This framework titled The Six Manifestations of Anti-Black Racism was developed by Nicole Bonney during her time as the Director of Equity at Children's Aid Society of Toronto. And while they are tailored towards child welfare, they have been really invaluable to me in the larger and deeper, more broad understanding of anti-Black racism, which is what I'll be bringing to you all today. Because Chima's focus was around systems and leadership, I'm also going to balance with a bit of a societal understanding of how anti-Black racism plays out and your role in interrupting and disrupting it as well. Uh, and so as I move through the presentation, please be mindful of any thoughts or questions. We'll certainly have time afterwards. Um, so feel free to pop them into the chat or write them down and we'll definitely get to them. I'm not opposed if you have questions along the way as well. Feel free to put up your hand and happy to do that. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So before we get into things, I'll just lay a foundation of who I am so that you understand the lens that I speak to you from. 
So as mentioned, my name is Heather Afa, and I've been practicing for over 10 years at this point as a social worker in Toronto. And I'm a first generation Ghanaian Canadian, which means that I'm of Ghanaian descent. My parents and eldest siblings were born in Ghana and immigrated to this country where me and one of my siblings were born. And I've had the pleasure of working various roles in my time as a social worker, beginning in youth work with Black children and youth, working within the HIV AIDS sector as a program coordinator, working as a frontline child welfare worker on various files related to adolescence, domestic violence, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect. Um, and I've spent some time as a psychotherapist as well, primarily supporting those with anxiety and depression. And currently, uh, as mentioned, I'm an anti-Black racism practice integration lead at the Children's Aid Society of Toronto, and I lead consultations on files open with Black families. I develop and facilitate training, and I develop strategies for addressing anti-Black racism within the agency. And I also sit as a member of the City of Toronto's Partnership and Accountability Circle and provide guidance and support to the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit, which is the unit of the city that is um, tackling uh, Toronto's anti action plan for addressing anti-Black racism. Next slide, please. So that's a bit about me, but also wanting to ground that whenever I speak about anti-Black racism, I try to balance between theory and practice. And I also try to bring in some personal experiences so that we remember that anti-Black racism is not just a title, it's not just words, but they're real and they're harmful and unique experiences. So next slide. Thank you so much. I'll just highlight, um, really overarching, I've been experiencing racism from a very young age um, in this country. In elementary school, I remember various comments made by my classmates, teachers, or even people I considered a friend at the time, some examples on the screen. Um, and as I aged and entered the workforce, it continued. Of course, I didn't necessarily have the language of anti-Black racism when I was eight years old, um, but that language has developed over the years through, of course, schooling, work experience, um, and now I'm able to bring a name to what I've been experiencing for a number of years. I recall uh, a pertinent experience being turned down for a job at a chain restaurant. I won't name them. Many of you probably eat there. Uh, because the uniform required straight hair to be worn down the back. I remember sitting in front of the interviewer with my Afro out uh, as they looked at me and said, I'm sorry, I know your resume is amazing and you're overqualified, but I just don't know how we'll explain to the other people why you were allowed to break the uniform requirements and they weren't, right? And so I recall other examples like being ID'd in the course of completing my work duties in the community. I recall being the only Black or racialized member of my team at one point, sitting in a meeting um, when I was doing frontline child welfare, speaking about how every time I go into a school or a police station or a hospital, I show my badge. Uh, and everyone at the table said, what are you talking about? I haven't shown my badge in 20 years. It's the picture's even rubbed off. No one's ever asked that, right? So these experiences um, really start to build up for me. Right. I, I need to start having an understanding of what's happening to me. How do I explain what I'm going through and how do I explain that to others so they get it? Because it was becoming apparent to me that everyone wasn't experiencing what I was experiencing. Right. And when I started speaking to people who look like me, we started having those similarities. Right. And that's where things got a bit more unique for me. Um, even thinking of some societal encounters of racism. Right. Last summer, I sat doing my nails in a nail salon. An individual walks in, uh, appears to be a white individual, points at me and says, I don't like N-words, and then walks out, right? Everyone in the salon heard this. No one says a word, right? So that's why we're here today to speak about what do you do when you actually see anti-Black racism operating in front of you? How do you interrupt it and disrupt it? How do we make sure that we're not complicit in our silence in those experiences, All right? Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So 
how is everything I just spoke about anti-Black racism? And what do we mean when we say anti-Black racism or inequality or some of the similar words that Chima was speaking to earlier? And so as mentioned, Nicole Bonney developed six individual yet interconnected ways of describing how anti-Black racism manifests itself in child welfare. Um, but as mentioned today, I'm going to broaden that understanding since every one of you on the line works in different systems. I'm going to focus more on societal um, manifestations of ABR. And this has been an incredibly valuable resource for me to better understand anti-Black racism. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, Chima, you just taught me the press framework and that seems really relatable uh, to this framework as well. And so take what you will out of all of this today and um, certainly all the frameworks would be helpful in educating and understanding. Next slide, please, we'll just begin. Thank you so much. So the first manifestation is criminalization and pathologization. Um, and they're big words, so I'll break down a bit here. That pathologization is the process of viewing everything that Black communities do as abnormal. So because it differs from what you do, and even if the action doesn't differ, we find that folks still perceive the person to be different and therefore their behavior seems different, right? And once you have that belief that someone is inherently different or acting in an abnormal way, you're more likely to not trust or treat that person in harsher ways until they prove themselves to be normal by the definition that you have. Right. And this subjects what it plays out as. It subjects folks um, to being overdiagnosed, overmedicated, marginalized, ostracized. Right. And that's why it goes hand in hand with criminalization, which is the process of holding those beliefs that Black folks are different against us. Right. Scrutinizing our past or the way we present using age-old racist stereotypes about us that were dangerous, violent, aggressive, angry, and therefore deserve to be punished, or we hold assumptions about criminal intent or activity, right? We saw examples of this a couple years ago for those of you who um, were aware when Toronto Police Services released their data related to use of force, and it had to come with an apology to Black communities, not widely accepted apology, but an apology to Black communities, where they acknowledged that Black folks in Toronto were more likely to have interactions with the police, and that those interactions were more likely to result in force being used, right? So that's an excellent example of the criminalization of Black bodies, right? So here, Toronto Police's uh, motto is to serve and protect, right? And the question to ask is to serve and protect too, right? When the data is released, it's showing that not everyone is being served and protected in the same way, right? So that's that key example of the criminalization there. Next slide, please, and I'll move into the next one. Thank you so much. So differential use of policy and procedure is the second manifestation. And again, we're going over ways that anti-Black racism shows up. How do we understand it? So it's not just a theory. We're breaking down six ways that it presents itself. So the second one here, differential use of policy and procedure. This occurs when we pick and choose when to adhere to our best practices, policies, procedures. There are many, I'm sure, in all of your workplaces. They exist. But for Black and racialized families, what we find is that folks often do not stray away from them and follow them in their most literal or punitive form, or in some cases, completely stray away from them and provide service in any way we see fit, right? Making room for our biases to lead our decision making instead of those best practices that we've implemented. So on the screen, I'm taking an example here from society of jaywalking, right? By all technicalities, when a jaywalker interferes with traffic, it is illegal, right? If I asked all of you on the line if you've ever jaywalked, I'd probably get a good showing of hands, if not all of them. Mine would go up as well, right? 
But if I asked how many of you have ever been arrested, charged, fined, beaten, or jailed for jaywalking, then the numbers would probably reduce, right? On the screen, you're seeing predominantly Canadian examples from Montreal, Halifax, and Vancouver. And I do this intentionally because sometimes when we speak about anti-Black racism, the focus is on the United States of America. We think that Canada is better. We think that anti-Black racism doesn't exist in Canada. The examples on the screen are of police officers in Montreal, Halifax, and Vancouver, where Black men were arrested, imprisoned, beaten, tased for jaywalking, right? So this is an ex excellent example of how a policy and procedure exists, but it's being used in its most rigid form for Black individuals, that differential use of that policy and procedure, and in its most loose form for other folks, right? Rarely see any involvement of jaywalking for many other folks, right? And so hopefully this is making sense here in that understanding. Yes, the policy exists, but how it's used differently with Black folks is meant is intentional um, in causing that harm, intentional in playing out that differential experience. Okay, next slide, please. I'm moving through them, but please, if there are questions or thoughts along the way, um, feel free to put up a hand. Our third one here is erasing culture and identity. So this occurs when we don't value Black cultures or see them as meaningful, and therefore we replace them with other cultures. Uh, when Chima was speaking to assimilation, this is similar to that process, right? So the understanding that one culture is better than another culture, and so therefore it should take over all the others. One of the ways that occurred uh, through colonization was through language, right? Like many countries with racialized individuals, countries in Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America with predominantly Black individuals also experience colonization. But there's some unique pieces um, to that experience, right? Even though independence has since been gained, you'll note the official languages in these countries remain the language of its colonizer, right? That's a unique experience. I did some research on my own. Um, and other countries who've experienced colonization, their second language might be English. The first official language is still the official language of that country, right? And so there's something unique. Thank you so much. There's something unique here about that, right? The examples on the screen are of countries colonized by the British and the French, um, but parts of Africa and Latin America were also colonized by the Portuguese. And so you'll see that as their official language. Brazil has a number of Afro-Latin folks. Portuguese is the language they speak. Angola in, in Africa, Portuguese is their first language, right? So you're seeing a number of examples. And in some cases, I'll also note here, folks even carry the last name of their ancestor slave owners. I'm gonna pause there for a minute to sit with that. Right. For example, Campbell, Anderson, Clark. When I do my research, these are listed as popular Jamaican last names. All of them are of European origin. They're Scottish, they're British, they're Irish, they're of European origin. Right. So we have to sit with what that means. How'd you get a European name from the other side of the world? Right. We have to dig into that history and understand how that happens. So that's that erasure of culture and identity that's been so ingrained for so long that now, maybe in 2024, we almost don't notice it. Cool. Wow. I didn't know parts of Africa, they speak French. That's cool. Oh, wow. Like, okay, that's great. You have the same last name as me. So interesting, right? But when we're looking back, how does that happen, right? That process of erasure of culture and identity is how that happens. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you. I'll move us um, into the next manifestation of most intrusive versus least intrusive. And 
we all know that in every decision we can make in our work and in our day-to-day -day lives, we have a continuum of responses that we can take. But with Black individuals, folks tend to begin at the most intrusive response and work backwards, or worse, they stay at the most intrusive, right? So I'm going to highlight an example here using George Floyd, which many, if not all of you, have likely heard George Floyd's story from 2020. And of note, um, many folks like to attribute uh, George Floyd's story to the uprising of anti-Black racism work. And it's so important to understand not only were there many, many, many examples of folks with similar experiences like George Floyd prior to that, but there has also been centuries of work on anti-Black racism, right? It's only changed its name, but the fight's been the same. Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, let's go all the way through, right? So ABR didn't begin in 2020, which I think is really important to highlight and note. We're centuries in uh, to the fight and into the experience, to the interruption and disruption, not just four years in. But this is a prime example of this manifestation. So I'll use it as a case example. Here I'll go to you all maybe. Does anyone know what George Floyd had allegedly done that caused police intervention? So we know the story. We know that the police intervention resulted in George Floyd's death. But let me take an answer from all of you on the line. Does anyone know why the police were actually intervening with George Floyd? Tough, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly correct. Thank you. So the allegation is that George Floyd used a counterfeit $20 bill to purchase a pack of cigarettes in a convenience store. Okay, so let's begin there. Because this manifestation is showing most intrusive interventions, let's begin with the understanding that the police came to George Floyd's car because he used a counterfeit $20 bill. In the spectrum, of crimes that one can commit, I'd probably put a counterfeit bill pretty darn low on that spectrum, yeah? So police officers attend George Floyd's car six seconds after George Floyd opens the door without telling him why they were even speaking to him, a gun is pointed at him. I'll just keep reminding because we're speaking about most intrusive interventions of anti-Black racism that all of this is happening because of a counterfeit $20 bill. Right. George Floyd's then forcibly removed from the vehicle and handcuffed because of a counterfeit $20 bill, pinned to the ground and held with a knee to his neck for nine and a half minutes, restricting his breathing because of a counterfeit $20 bill. Later that, no later that night, George Floyd is pronounced dead because of a counterfeit $20 bill. Right. And I keep repeating that so we understand how most intrusive actions were taken here with a Black identified man a murder in response to an unarmed person who used a counterfeit bill, right? If that's not anti-Black racism, how else do we explain that? And it's a really, really, really prime example of that most intrusive. Absolutely. Were there least intrusive options these officers could have taken? Absolutely. A million more options, right? But we saw an immediate six seconds after the door opens, we see that most intrusive response and it never stops, never works backwards to least intrusive. And so compare that to your own systems that you work within as well, child welfare, hospital, community systems. Six seconds after you meet someone, do we go to that most intrusive response or do we begin at our lesser intrusive options and work our way? Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So I'll move us into racist stereotypes and assumptions, which is the fifth manifestation. Um, but as I go along, hopefully that interconnection that I spoke about is making some sense here, right? 
every example I've given so far, I could just as easily have used as the example for any one of the manifestations, right? George Floyd could also have been the case example for racist stereotypes and assumptions. What do you have to believe about the person that you came across to draw a gun on them six seconds into meeting them, right? There has to be some of those stereotypes and assumptions operating as well. So really see the way that they play into one another, that we're needing to understand them separately so we can more in depth understand ABR, but they're so interconnected and so intertwined, um, which is that really complex system of racism that Chima was speaking to. This is what makes it so complex, right? So in my opinion, racist stereotypes and assumptions is the foundation of all the manifestations. In the original framework developed by Nicole Bonney, she cites surveillance and invisibility as the foundation. I absolutely understand that as well, and we'll get to that in a minute. But for me, the racist stereotypes and assumptions that are held about Black individuals are the reasons that we're criminalized, why most intrusive actions are taken, why our culture and identity is erased, because Folks think they already know who we are based off the stereotypes that they believe to be true about us, right? These racist stereotypes reinforce Black women, like myself, as angry, harsh, and capable of displaying gentleness, love, or affection, right? Or Black men as dangerous and violent criminals. And these form into the biases that fire through brains at every exposure to or interaction with a Black individual. So... On the screen, you're seeing a campaign that ran across the city of Toronto probably eight years ago, in 2016, I believe. And this campaign was an effort to bring bias to the forefront, an effort to speak about anti-Black racism, to make folks uncomfortable. And it's trying to highlight that when faced with a choice, who would folks pick, right? So you have an example of a Black woman and white woman on the screen, and they say, quick, rent to one or a white man and a black man on the screen, quick, hire one, right? And rental discrimination is real. Let's also speak about that for a minute, right? There are ads posted by landlords online, Kijiji, Craigslist, whatever the case may be. Please no black people, no blacks allowed, right? It's not legal to do these things, but folks are doing them and doing them really boldly online as well, right? Or the example I always recall, um, my uh, dad told me a story of my uncle trying to purchase a car and the dealer says to him, oh, we already sold that car. Sorry, it's no longer available. My uncle obviously knew that not to be true. So he sends one of his white male friends and his friend goes up to the same dealer and the dealer sells him the car, right? What's the reason there? My uncle's Ganyan. There's a lot of stereotypes about car fraud in Ghana, that Ontario stolen cars land in Ghana, so he doesn't want to sell to my uncle, but he'll sell to my uncle's white friend, right? So these things are real, and they're happening every single day in these examples. And we also know that the work examples are real, too. I gave you just a couple of my own personal experiences, right? But we know that even when folks look at resumes, personal preference and familiarity impacts the screening process. So in this example on the right are folks who are leaders of an organization, perhaps white identified leaders looking for familiarity. Might they pick the resume that says Luke or would they pick the resume that says Olua Funileo, right? We don't know. But we know that the research is showing us that there is an impact to that experience, that folks are more likely to pick the familiar name, right? So these are those racist stereotypes and assumptions. You see a name, you see a face, you see a skin tone, you see a stature. Immediately you have an idea of what that means and who that person is. They'll either be dangerous, they won't be smart, they won't be as good at the job, they're going to be lazy, they're going to be messy, they're going to mess up my home. All the stereotypes start coming in, right? In a bit we'll speak about how we can interrupt and disrupt. Next slide, please. Thank you. The last manifestation is surveillance and invisibility. And so Black community members experience hyper surveillance and it's evident in multiple spheres 
from employment to retail establishments, schools, criminal justice, walking down the street, right? If folks can remember early COVID days when they spoke about um, lockdowns, when they thought maybe we'd do the eight or nine o'clock lockdown, I can't remember what the time was. And there was an immediate um, sort of response from black communities, right? It's already near illegal as a black person to walk down the street. And now you also want to add a time that sounds like a trap, right? Sounds like a TPS trap. Now they're giving you an opportunity to stop folks at 8 p.m., right? So some of those examples of surveillance we hear of um, priority neighborhoods, right? Some of you who maybe perhaps work child welfare or work other um, jobs where you go into the community, you might see some communities that are heavily policed. Cruisers park in the neighborhood or drive through the neighborhood. When you need the police, somehow, never there to be found. When you call them yourself, you get put on hold, right? But they're sitting parked in neighborhoods, right? That's that surveillance that we're speaking of. Sometimes in child welfare, we get referrals. I can recall an ABR consult. Um, and when I say ABR, the acronym for anti-Black racism, where the referral was a police officer saying, I was actually just walking through the hallway, just parked, walked into a building, walking through the hallway, and I passed something and I heard something and it worried me. So I'm letting you all know that, right? No reason to be there, just perusing the hallway of a building, predominantly Black identified tenants. Right. So these are some of those examples of surveillance. Right. And simultaneously, invisibility occurs when there is an under acknowledgement of black folks and, and our needs, sometimes blatantly ignoring black individuals as a whole. Right. And so when black folks are being ignored or rendered invisible, this can lead to that lack of representation in the workforce, in media. That's how you see some of that tokenism that we speak about, right? Some of that tokenism, you might watch a commercial and see one black person in it. You might watch a movie and see one black person in it, but they unfortunately die in the first 20 minutes, right? Some of those pieces are that invisibility, underrepresentation. In our workforce, it might look like leadership, right? Maybe there's slim numbers in leadership. Maybe it looks like frontline social workers, slim numbers there. I know at our agency, we had to engage in some um, equity hiring to balance out the numbers, right? So the example on the screen shows surveillance in a retail store, for example. So it speaks about, uh, and this is just a newspaper clipping, similar to my differential use of policy and procedure slide. Those were actual newspaper clippings or online articles, maybe I'm dating myself by saying newspaper clipping, um, shopping while black. Marketplace finds some shoppers targeted by retailers because of race, right? So that's that surveillance experience. When you're in a retail store, black folks can get all the help they need because when you turn around, the staff member's already behind you, following you to see if you've taken anything, if you appear suspicious, if you can afford the things in the store, what are you even doing in this store, right? Staff often watch over Black customers based off of those racist stereotypes and assumptions that were criminals. And then conversely, the other example on the screen is highlighting invisibility in restaurants as an example. So the, the clipping is speaking about why waiters give Black customers poor service. And that's also coming from those racist stereotypes and assumptions that Black customers don't tip well, right? Can't tell you the amount of restaurants that I've sat in waiting ages for a bill, not getting a refill on water, right? Just with this is the worst service. I don't know how this place got 4.9 on Google, right? Just terrible service. And it started to dawn on me. I look around the room. Not a whole lot of other people look like me in restaurants either in this city, right? And so then I'm starting to clue in. What does that mean? What's happening there? right? Some of that invisibility is playing out. I'm already deemed an invaluable customer because racist stereotypes and assumptions say I don't tip well, right? Why would you waste your time on me? I don't tip well. Off you go to the tables where you're going to make your money. That's what the stereotype is doing. And that's how the invisibility is being created. Let me pause here for a moment before we go to the next slide in case there's any thoughts or questions on the manifestations so far, 
And then I'll move into a bit of how I interrupt and disrupt and what I think all of you can do as well. Okay, I know we'll have some time at the end. Um, so I'll move along and we'll save that piece for the end. Thanks, Ashik. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, you can go one slide over. That's great. So now that we've gone through the ways anti-Black racism manifests itself, six ways presented, what are we supposed to do about that, right? So huge, so complicated, so ingrained, and we haven't even brought in intersections of folks' identity, right? Where anti-2SLGBTQ plus sentiment plays out, um, xenophobia plays out, all the other aspects that make this even more challenging, right? So what do we do? I'm here to start with some of the things that I do. And then in a minute, I'll end with some of the things I think you all can do too, right? So education, and Chima spoke to this as well, right? And there's, for me, I continue to educate myself, even as a Black woman, even as uh, a social worker that's practicing within diversity, equity, and inclusion, the education continues. Um, so I can have the language to name my experiences, but also so I can have the language to share knowledge with others, right? And that moves into others. I educate others to help them understand the experiences of Black peoples or problem awareness, right? Help others understand what the issue is and to be able to share that knowledge with even more people. So you'll all hear this today and then you'll leave and you'll go tell even more people. You'll tell your colleagues, your family, your friends, your children on the line, right? I surround myself with diverse representation of black peoples, right? Because that's that counter to the racist stereotypes and assumptions. We have to be able to counter that. So I surround myself with diverse representations to do so. I interrupt people gently, but I do, right? When they're considering doing something that would perpetuate anti-Black racism, so a decision in the work, for example, that isn't grounded or rooted in good clinical rationale, I interrupt that, I question that, I ask, like, walk me through, how did you get here, right? How'd you come to that decision? If this was your plan Z, the most intrusive thing should be your last plan, what was A through Y? What did you do? What else did you try, right? I correct and challenge people, right? So when they do or say something racist, we can talk about that. Might send you an article, might send you a video, might have a chat, might book a meeting with you, right? Let's chat about that. Let's actually unpack. So it's not the example I spoke about in the nail salon where someone calls me the N-word and the whole nail salon goes back to filing their nails. No, let's talk about it. What just happened there? Let's speak about what's wrong with that. How do we change and shift that? I help others um, to make decisions that benefit Black peoples or at the very least um, do no or do less harm, right? So as systems, those who are working in systems, they're large and in every system, Black folks are experiencing um, disparity in their experiences, often overrepresentation as well. And yet, that invisibility I spoke to as well within systems, right? So let's chat about those decisions, right? So I help folks through that, particularly in my full-time role as an ABR lead, right? Sitting and packing, unpacking um, case examples, right? In real time, a decision needs to be made. We're speaking about it. What's the decision? How do we root it in the manifestations? How do we make a different one, right? I tell stories that challenge stereotypes, uh, which is important, right? So I'll highlight positive news stories like an 11 year old black child with a university degree, right? Or I'll tell positive stories about my father and being a daddy's girl countering that stereotype that one assumes black fathers are absent, right? So some of those stories that challenge stereotypes, we protest, where the opportunity exists to demand change, peaceful protest always, but where the opportunity exists to demand change. And then I create some of those new best practices or 
remain outspoken until they're created, right? So developing some of those strategies. Recently, I've developed a, an intake uh, equity strategy in the branch that I work within. And this was an over year long process working with the entire branch, the directors of the branch, and really sitting and unpacking what are the major worries and inequalities in this branch. We can't keep overlooking them. The staff, the supervisors, the families, they're telling us about them. And then what do we need to do to address them? What needs to change in our branch to address them? And then I call attention to anti-Black racism. Um, sometimes too much maybe for folks. Uh, you can't really watch a show or a movie or walk down the street with me anymore without me calling attention to anti-Black racism. But silence is complicity is what I stay with. So if we're not talking about it, we're allowing it to continue to happen. Um, Kendi speaks about that in How to Be Anti-Racist, the book that Chima is referencing. There's no middle ground. You're either a racist or you're anti-racist. There's no middle ground of not racist, right? Silence is complicit, right? There's no middle ground. You can't say I'm not racist. You either have to be an anti-racist or you are complicit in racism. Next slide, please. And one more, Ashley. Thank you. And now your turn. And your list doesn't look all that different um, from my list. But what I think all of you can do to address anti-Black racism is to educate yourself, again, having that awareness. Um, so don't end here. Many books that can be read, many videos that can be watched, many conversations you can have. There's a lot of education that comes from speaking to Black individuals, Black communities about their experiences, right? So educate yourself. Check your biases. Um, I think it's so important to understand that we're all capable of perpetuating anti-Black racism, right? And so as racialized folks yourself, it, it doesn't mean you're exempt from perpetuating anti-Black racism. So you too have to check your biases that exist about Black folks, Black communities, and what you do about that, right? How they're coming into your decisions at work, how they're coming into your decisions in the community, right? See Black people as diverse and unique individuals. And this is again, an effort to challenge those racist stereotypes and assumptions. I often speak about, for example, our white counterparts, um, can be front page news for the most egregious crime. Um, and no one would ever then look at another white person and think, oh my goodness, all of you must do that, right? But that happens with Black folks. When Black folks commit a crime or something negative is associated with a Black person, all of a sudden it's associated with our entire race. And we see Black folks as that entire thing. There's beauty in community. There's strengths in unity and community. But when we're creating community out of negative experiences or negative stereotypes, that's something that needs to be interrupted. We need to see folks as individuals, right? Interrupt and disrupt anti-Black racism when you see or hear it. This one is like the easy to say on paper, perhaps tough to do in life, but one of the most sort of important and key ones, don't be complicit, don't be a bystander, right? Interrupt and disrupt. When you're seeing, when you're hearing it at work, it might look like interrupting it with your supervisor when they're telling you to do something that doesn't quite sit right. It might look like interrupting it with your family when they say something that doesn't quite sit right, right? Raise children who are anti-racist. This one's a future forward. Uh, this system of anti-Black racism is so complex. Um, it's going to take all of us to fight it, to dismantle it, to break it down. And that includes the next generation, right? So raise children who are anti-racist, not just not racist, anti-racist, right? And we can lean on Kendi's framework about what makes someone anti-racist. Give opportunities to Black folks. And I thank you for this one, right? You could have just as easily have held this meeting today amongst yourselves, but you didn't. You invited Chima and myself so we could speak to our experiences, to our knowledge, so we could share that, right? And that's important in not rendering Black folks invisible or silent. We're seeing some of that happening um, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Robin D'Angelo, for example, learned a lot 
from Black folks and then took that and made a lot of money from those books and those talks, right? So let's return the opportunities back to Black folks. That's where all the knowledge came from. Robin D'Angelo doesn't know about ABR. She learned about ABR, right? So let's keep the opportunities with Black folks, keep the voice with Black folks. Be open to learning and feedback. And this is really to say, as I mentioned, we're not exempt. Um, more likely than not, in some way, shape, or form, you have or are perpetuating anti-Black racism, and you need to be more afraid that you are doing that than afraid of the person who tells you about that, right? You have to fear being racist more than you fear being called racist, right? And that's a quote from Ajoma Oluo, right? Who writes the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, right? She speaks about that. You have to fear racism more than you fear being called racist. Be open, right? Believe Black folks. So this one's huge. Don't make us prove. This happens a lot in big systems that racism needs to be proved. ABR needs to be proven, right? All these big barriers to being able to make complaints about that piece. Break down some of those barriers, right? Practice your work equitably, meaning similar situations have similar outcomes. That's my most basic understanding of equity. Similar situations should have similar outcomes. And challenge others when you're being asked to do something inequitable, as I spoke about, particularly in your workplaces. And then some more of those societal examples, support Black businesses and projects, right? We put a lot of funding into a lot of big box corporation, um, and that supports certain identities and not necessarily others. Or we have predominantly Black-owned businesses, for example, like, uh, or sorry, Black-used businesses like hair stores, but they're not owned by Black individuals, right? So support Black businesses and projects, keep them alive so that we lessen that oppression that's being faced within the city. Next slide, please. I believe that next slide is wrapping us. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Deepa, maybe I'll throw back to you um, if there's any thoughts or questions from folks. Please feel free to ask questions. If anyone have any questions, you can either type the questions or can ask. Any questions? Please go ahead. Hi, Prasad. You're just on mute. Hey, to see uh, you. Yeah. Well, good to see you too, Heather. Thank you. And it's not a question, and it's more of a commentary that, uh, you know, thank you very much for pointing out the you know, uh, being anti-racist is an active work and that also requires uh, a lot of effort. And when you do the right thing, uh, the chances that you may not be immediately rewarded or you may not be rewarded in your lifetime at all. And it is, it is the hard work. And um, so just wanted to say that to my fellow uh, social workers that, you know, you all are here for a right reason. You all decided to get on to this field with um, clear understanding of its challenges. And um, having 45 people 
listening to this conversation this morning is actually giving me a lot of hopes and giving me a lot of positive energy and thank you everyone and um, thank you heather for um, you know actually i really enjoyed your presentation that it's like step by step that you're uh, giving us the right tools also the right framework to reflect and chima and as always uh, a good friend and a mentor so uh, every time when i listen to you i'm actually learning more and more in depth about prasi so thank you thank you is there any other question Heather, one thing I would like to mention is when I came to Canada and I started working amongst the, amongst the white folks, one of the subtle racism that I faced was a comment they once told me that, oh, you could speak English. We weren't expecting that you'll speak English. So many of us might have, uh, you know, faced that comment or subtle racism. And how do you think we can effectively educate our fellow colleagues or maybe our friends uh, on how to handle subtle racism. Yeah, thanks, Deepa. Um, certainly, I'm sure many of the experiences and the framework that I spoke about is relatable to a lot of your own experiences. Often at work, I'll use uh, the framework, even though it's a framework related to ABR, to speak about racism in general related to other racialized folks. Um, and I mean, what would I say? I'd say uh, that's where we call attention to things, right? So that's a comment I wouldn't let slide. Um, that's a comment that would say, of, of course, what did you expect? I love questions for my own approach. So I'd say, yeah, of course, what else did you expect? And wait for them to actually have to answer, right? Because there's such learning in having to answer. You're saying it very openly. Oh, I didn't know you'd speak English. But when I ask you why you didn't think that, you have to come up with an answer. And that's where the learning and the conversation happens from that answer, right? And then you're able to speak to some more of your own experience or some more of your own education, but I don't necessarily take it as your job either to educate folks. Um, but for me, that's what I'd say is I'd ask a question back, wait for them to have to answer it, and then decide whether we're unpacking that answer further uh, or supporting with some education or whether we're leaving them to sit and reflect if they don't have the answer. Perfect, thank you. Any other yeah. questions? I think that Dr. Add to what Heather said, I think that's very, very important. You also have to be aware that this is courageous conversation. You know, um, it takes bravery to actually um, speak to somebody who has power over you. You know, we always try to work with power weight, right? So your goal is to ensure power weight, not power over, that you have somebody who's working. Um, uh, you know, we take power over you. So I think it's difficult for you to have that conversation. And sometimes we all know that it can also lead to, um, uh, you know, maybe, you know, somebody being fired from their job, right? If it's uh, your manager saying things of that nature, where do you have the courage, you know, to have that conversation? So I think, you know, at the same time, you know, I think it, it will serve a higher purpose if you have that conversation, right? So, and uh, going, you know, maybe having, um, uh, you know, um, uh, speaking to the person immediately, you know, about this, uh, how you felt about it in a respectful manner, right? You know, I think makes so much sense. So I think that is something that is important for us to, you know, do. We have to make sure we champion, you know, anti-racism practices across the sector, across every platform that we're in. Now, there's something that I want to mention also. Racism does, does, does not just 
it's not something that you just see between white and people of color, right? There's also what you call ethnic racism, right? And uh, Abraham X. Candy spoke about that very well. You know, where ethnic groups think they are superior over the other, right? So that is something. And then they have policies that also bring other um, uh, racialized groups down, right? So that's something, you know, within your system, you have the caste system as well. You know, the caste system is, 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 a, is racist in nature. So these are the kind of walls that you want to break down yourself as social workers. And I heard that spoke about that eloquently, right? So um, uh, you have the tools, you know the tools already. Also, you have your own tools as well. You know, there's none that's wrong for you to follow. So I think you have to marshal that in your day-to-day -day practice. While it is courageous, it takes bravery. You know, it's important that we do that work. And, as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chima. If we have no more questions, may I please request everyone to please turn on their video so that we can get a screen share. A presentation with everyone's beautiful faces. Finally, requesting a few more folks to uh, please come on video. Uh, it would be good to see a screen full of faces. It's okay even if you are not well dressed up, we're happy to see your faces. Smile, everyone. I hope you got this screen share. Yes, got it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mayor Pat Elsa. Uh, Deepa, we have a few comments in the chat box. Uh, if you'd like to go through them. Thank you, Pichu Peter. Uh, I hope the presenters have seen the chats. Our members were mentioning their appreciation for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Ajesh. Perfect. May I request Elsa to deliver the word of thanks? Thank you, Deepa. In the profound words of Dr. Martin Luther King, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Dearest Maso family, with deep gratitude, I extend my sincere appreciation to each participant in this virtual gathering orchestrated by Maso in honor of the Black History Month. Our privilege was elevated by the presence of Ms. Heather, anti-Black -black racism leader at CAS Toronto, whose illumination on recognizing and addressing anti-Black racism resonated profoundly. And Ms. Heather, when you were listing down the things that we could do, I uh, correct and challenging people when they do or say something racist hit me really hard. And I do uh, declare right now that no matter who is being racist, whether it's my family, friend, or employer, I'm definitely going to start speaking up. Uh, once again, a special acknowledgement to Mr. Chima Sifin, whose directorship of diverse equity and inclusion at PLC has infused our event with wisdom through the thought-provoking opening remarks. Thank you each and every one for contributing to this event and being an integral part, part of this transformative con uh, conversation. Once again, uh, I extend my sincere thanks to all the members of MASO for organizing such a meaningful event for us. Thank you and have a wonderful week.
Thank you everyone.